السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه وبع. We thank Allah that we've seen ourselves this evening. Just a five minutes presentation. Tomorrow will be the great day for all of us. We pray to Allah to make it easy for us to meet and for us to benefit from one another. But I pose the question, what is the greatest need of Muslims today? I'm asking. What is the greatest need of Muslims today? Somebody saying to be a Muslim is the greatest need. You're already a Muslim. Why? A brother is saying that we need unity so that we can have strength. That's a good point. Worship Allah all the time. Any further contribution? <laughs> huh? To increase our email? Good contribution? Charity. Charity? Like the work in this mosque? Sincerity of heart? Reform ourselves? All these are wonderful ideas. But I want to task myself and each one of you to go back to Sirah and reflect on how the Sahaba lived after the Prophet. How did they live and worked together? How did they live and worked together? They were, during the time of the Prophet, Two things happened. The Prophet respected them and they loved him. Imagine the Prophet respected the Sahaba. In morning training methods, if you have a child in the house, the child wants recognition from you before he listens to you. Why? Because every human being feels important. And before William James of America, that eminent psychologist could even mention this point, the prophet had earlier said it many, many times. By respecting each of the Sahaba and the talent each of them carried. This was done because every human being feels important. And therefore, if you recognize that individual, he feels elated and motivated towards action. So the Prophet showed respect towards the Sahaba. How did he do it? In many ways. One, recognizing the talent in each one of them. For example, he said, "A'lamukum bil halali wal haram mu'adh bin Jabal." That the most learned among you, among the Sahaba, in respect of halal and haram is mu'adh bin Jabal. Look at this multitude of individuals, and the Prophet singling him out as the most learned in terms of haram and halal. Look at how such an individual will feel. Then he also said, "A'alamukum bil faraid Zayd bin Thabit." That when it comes to inheritance, the most learned among you is Zayd bin Thabit. And he also said, "A'alamukum bil qadai Ali bin Abi Talib." That when it comes to settling disputes and passing verdicts and giving rulings, the most learned among you. It's Ali bin Abi Talib. Recognizing further the wonderful nature that Allah had given to Abu Bakr Siddiq, 
he mentioned rightly that if the iman of Abu, Abu Bakr Sadiq was put in one scale and the rest of the thousands of Sahaba were put in one, Abu Bakr's iman would outweigh all of them. And imagine he's saying, tell him, Umar ibn Khattab, that any time Satan saw you, he ran away. He was giving signals in respect of how the leader should handle a group. You should move into the group and identify talents. Because societal development, the development of any society is dependent upon how it identified the talented ones, nourishes them, harnesses the talents, and use the talents. <coughs> because if you have a multitude of about 1,000 people, you discover that only 10 will be talented. And the development of the rest and their progress will be dependent upon how they handle the 10 talented ones. And this was hugely recognized by the prophet. Again, if you look at the seer of the Prophet he respected the Sahaba a lot. Imagine during Ghazwat Badr, and he was positioning the Sahaba. You stand here, one there, another there, and there was a small river, and he positioned the Sahaba with the river in front of them. Let's take it that this, this table, sir, you know, was the position of the river. And the Sahaba was standing with the river in front of them. The one of them, out of respect, deep respect and love for the prophet, unlike us, the young man went to the prophet first to inquire about something. He asked the prophet, where you had positioned us, was it a revelation from the Almighty? If it was indeed a revelation from the Almighty, then we all have to submit. Or it is Harb or Makeda. Or it's just a question of war and strategy. Meaning the effort came from you and not Wahi. Then the prophet said, Harb or Makeda, it is war and strategy. Then he said, if that is the case, then I have something to say about the way you have positioned us. And the prophet said, go ahead. So he said, I suggest that we allow the river to be behind us so that in case we have injuries, we can have easy access to water and the kuffar cannot. And the prophet listened to him. It only shows that wisdom is not the repository of an individual. Or the bona fide property of an individual. Number two, the acquisition of wisdom or the gift of wisdom has no respect for age. Your own son can even teach you a lesson. During Gazwat Tabuk, the professor recognizing the unique qualities of the Sahaba, chose Usama bin Zaid, a boy of 18, to lead the Muslim army. Even though the prophet did not live to see the Gazwat Tabuk, he tossed a war, an expedition against the Roman Empire. But later in time, Zaid bin Osama bin Zaid at 18 was far, far. He could easily be the grandchild of Abu Bakr Siddiq, the grandchild of Omar bin Khattab, the grandchild of Abdurrahman bin Auf. So later, historians ask themselves, why did the prophet choose Usama bin Zaid? Delving further into the history of that young boy, they realized that the young man had a particular quality the other Sahaba didn't have. But nobody knew it, but the prophet knew. And it was this choice of Usama's leadership that gave rise to what is known in modern management as situational leadership. Those of you who have specialized in management, you know what I'm talking about. They call it situational leadership, meaning you choose the leader based on the circumstance. So for example, if we are going to war, 
We need Quranic recitation. Huh? But it is not a necessity that the Hafiz should lead. We need somebody with courage, tact, patience, and the ability to react to critical situations. These are the qualities that are required. So don't say that, oh, now we are at the war front, the Imam should lead. I'm telling you, the Imam will be bombed and thrown somewhere. So you place people where they deserve to be placed. So when historians delve into the psychological history, the history of the psychology of Osama bin Zaid, they realize that he had one unique quality, and that is the ability to roll out options and address difficult situations without panic. You know, when you panic, you take bad decisions. You can only take good decisions when your psychological setup is in good shape. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had gifted the young man with the quality of not panicking under any difficult circumstance. And that was the kind of person the woman needed at the time to lead it, to face the Roman Empire. This was the unique respect the Prophet had for the Sahaba. Imagine the Prophet being on Mount Uhud with Abu Bakr Siddiq and then Omar bin Khattab and Uthman bin Affan and the mountain started to shake, to quiver. Then the Prophet spoke that be calm because there are on you a Siddiq wa Shahidan. There are on you the Siddiq, the trustworthy person. And then Shahidan, two meters, they have not died yet. That in itself is a prophecy. You know, Umar bin Khattab was killed. He died as a Shaheed. Osman bin Affan also died as a Shaheed. But when they were even alive, the prophet had predicted that that was how they were going to die. Then he rightly indicated, describing the Sahaba, that if any one of you even spends gold, the value or the magnitude or the degree of Mount Ohud, you can never reach the level of any of my followers. And Ibn Masud summed up the love they had for the Prophet. So that any time he spoke, the rapt attention that was given to his presentations was so deep that even if a bird dropped on the head of any of them, the person would not feel it. And everything they heard from him. Ibn Masud self speaking, they made sure they practice it till the next revelation comes. That is why Said Kutub in his book, The Milestone, you may not get it on the market today, in Arabic it's Ma'alim fi Tariq, gives a chapter called The Quranic Generation. And he mentions that. One of the things that helped the Sahaba to be unique and therefore deserve of the description he was giving them in the book was the fact that whatever they had from the prophet, the prophet sallam, they made sure they lived by it. The challenge Muslims are facing today is that a lot of ideas are crossing the path of Muslims. Challenging the basic roots of this religion. To the extent that today, some Muslims are training their own enemies in their own homes because of the flow of ideas. The challenge upon us, therefore, 
is to commit ourselves, as I said in the Khutbah, constantly. And then protect our kids. Today, a lot of Muslims' lives is like the life of the guinea fowl. Do you know the guinea fowl? Have you ever seen a guinea fowl? You have never seen one in your life. The guinea fowls lays its, the female guinea fowl lays the eggs, but cannot hatch them. The hatching is done by the hen. So when the kids of the guinea fowl are born, they have the feathers of guinea fowls because of the original place that they came from. But after some time, because when the hen hatches the, the, the eggs, the newly born guinea fowls will have to stay with the hen. Give yourself two, three months. The kids of the guinea fowl carries, they carry the feathers of guinea fowl. But the behavior is like that of the hen. Today, because we don't have institutions that will train our children for us, non-Muslims are training our children. And therefore, if the Muslim does not sit up, your child will be Abdullah, but his behavior will be like a non-Muslim. That is a challenge for you and me. Protectionism is a spirit that is shared by all. And every single family on the surface of the earth is trying to protect its family with the ideas it believes in. It's a competitive arena and we have no choice if we want to remain as Muslims in the generations that will come after us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tomorrow is a long session. We'll have more time to be together. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذا هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب إن الله ملائكة يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين